Guys, this um, classification scheme you see up here has helped me for 25 years of uh, doing hematology. It's never failed me. Nor the way I'm showing you to go about working up anemias has never failed me either. You have to have a system for doing things, not just hematology, that's everything. Okay, you have to have a system. If someone comes in with dyspnea, you have to have a system for how you work that up. You know, someone with chest pain, a system for how you work that up. Okay. So, when you have anemia, in my opinion, the best way of uh, classifying is by the mean corpuscular volume. There's a couple things, as I alluded to already, that if you have small cells and large cells, they'll come out, you know, with a normal MCV. But overall, this works pretty good. For blood purposes, unequivocal. I mean, it's just absolute, straightforward hematology. I mean, no tricks, no nothing. And so it's relatively straightforward. This will help you for part one, two, and three. Everything I'm saying is on part two and on part three. So it works for both, both all three tests. All right, we're going to deal with uh, the microcytic anemias first. Then we'll go into the macrocytic. And then we'll go into the normocytic. Now, in the normocytic, you see the reticulocyte. Uh, account is the most important way of separating out how you're going to work up normal cytic anemias. Remember, whenever you have a reticulocyte count, uh, that's what the uh, technologists uh, give you in percentage. You have to make a correction first of the degree of anemia, hematocrit of the patient over 45 times the reticulocyte count. Okay, and then you look and see if it says anything about polychromasia. If it doesn't say polychromasia is present, then that's it. You just correct for the anemia. And you have a number. If it's 3% or higher, bone marrow is responding appropriately. If it's 2% or lower, it isn't. It's just that simple. If polychromasia is present, then you divide that initial correction for the anemia divided by 2. You look at the number. 3% or higher, good response. 2% or lower, bad response. Very simple, straightforward way of looking at it. Okay. So we'll be going through all of these things. Um, now, whoa, okay. A couple uh, physical signs of anemia that I've chosen here. This, of course, is what? What do they call this? Spoon nails, huh? What's that a sign of? Iron deficiency. Another name is colonichia, okay? This is called chelosis when you get cracking. Yeah, that's due to everything. And you go like this, uh -huh, uh -huh. you know, it can be anything that produces this, but you also can see it in iron deficiency, you can see it in riboflavin deficiency, so that's not specific for anything. And then, you know, pallor of the conjunctiva. If you're a conjunctiva or pale, you have uh, six grams or less uh, hemoglobin. If you look in the uh, palmar creases, now this only works for those of the of, uh, Caucasian. If you look in the palmar creases and you don't see red in them, you're anemic. Okay. Mine has nice red things in it, so I'm not anemic. Ha, 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 ha. Okay. Don't come up here, women, showing me your pale creases, because that means you have iron deficiency. All right. This is the lead line. Okay, you see that kind of discoloration right at the gum margin. You've seen that lead poisoning. Um, remember, the uh, neurologic exam is very important in B12 deficiency because you knock off the uh, uh, posterior columns and your lateral cortical spinal tract. So you have proprioception abnormalities, decreased vibratory sensation. Uh, and then if you have low motor uh, of the uh, lateral cortical spinal tract, you have the Binsky's and stuff like that. So these are kind of classic things that we see in different kinds of anemia. We're going to start with the microcytic anemias, and you have this little chart in your uh, notes. And uh, I like to start first when we're dealing with microcytics with iron studies. I'm going to make this as simple as I can. There's basically four iron studies that you can get. Serum iron. The normal serum iron is about 100. Okay? That's easy to remember. Same thing as the alveolar or oxygen. It's normally 100. We have ferritin, which I think is the best test. Serum ferritin. That's a soluble form, a circulating form of iron storage. Ferritin. And the beauty of it is it represents the amount of iron you also have stored in your bone marrow. So, you know, if you had to pick one test for diagnosing iron deficiency or anemia chronic disease or iron overload disease, it'd be serum ferritin because that's the best overall screening test. 
Okay, so we have serum iron, we have serum ferritin. Now we get into some problems that you have. And uh, that's TIBC, total iron binding capacity, and percent saturation. Very confused by students. Please tell me what the carrying protein is for iron, please. Trans, which means carry ferrin. So that's pretty easy. Transferrin carries iron. That's the name of the protein. Where is it made? Where are all proteins made? Liver. Okay. Listen very, very carefully. Transferrin and total iron binding capacity are the same. Because listen, just think about it. Total iron binding capacity. You just finished telling me that transferrin is what carries iron. They're the same. All right. That's fact one. Fact two. There is a relationship of iron stores in the bone marrow with the transferrin synthesized in your liver. And it's a very simple relationship. When the iron stores in your bone marrow are deficient, a la iron deficiency, that is a signal for the liver to make more transferrin. So it's increased. Therefore, what's the total iron binding capacity in iron deficiency? Increased. Very good. So low iron stores, increased transferrin synthesis, increased TIBC. Kind of like an inverse relationship like hormones. T4 increased, TSH decreased. T4 decreased, TSH increased. Iron stores decreased, transferrin TIBC increased. And the vice versa. Iron stores increased, transferrin synthesis decreased. Decreased TIBC. Very, very simple. Very, very simple. Okay? All right. Percent saturation is a calculation, actually. It's your serum iron divided by your total iron binding capacity. Now, normally the serum iron, as I said, is 100. Normally the TIBC is 300. So you tell me what the normal percent saturation is. 100 over 300. You guys are pretty good in math, right? Certainly better than me. I'm an idiot in math. Total idiot. 33%. You know what? That's a very interesting thing. You had a very good teacher in endocrinology called Porter. Okay? And did you notice that uh, uh, hormones, when they bind to their binding proteins like thyroid hormone and thyroid binding globulin, tra transcortin and cortisol, that's always one-third of the binding sites are occupied by whatever is on the binding protein. Isn't that correct? Isn't 33% one-third? Yes or no? Yes. Well, that's no, that's no, that's no surprise. One third of the binding sites on binding proteins are usually occupied by the things they bind. It's even pretty close for albumin. Okay, albumin about, you know, about one third of the binding sites are occupied by, uh, uh, I mean, have calcium binding to them. So it's pretty close for that too. So it's a concept in terms of binding proteins and what they bind. It's roughly one third of the binding sites, and that's what percent saturation of iron is talking about. Okay, so the iron's 100, the total iron binding capacity is 300, so the percent saturated, 100 over 300 is 33%. Okay, so those are your terms. Those are your terms that we're going to be using uh, when we discuss the microcytic anemias, where, where, which involve usually the problems that deal with iron. Okay, so those are your iron studies. You have this diagram in your notes, and I uh, always like to give you mechanisms. Okay. I'm going to use this note, this, uh, this slide right here, to discuss the pathogenesis of each of the microcytic anemias. Okay? And then you can go to the tables. All the anemias, all the white blood cell problems are in tables. Cool. Do they work? Big time. Big time. So they're nice, simple, and neat. Okay, remember, the microcytic anemias have a few things in common. One, they're microcytic. Why? Well, basically because their problem is in making hemoglobin. That's the mechanism of microcy microcytic anemias. They can't make hemoglobin. I don't get it. Well, here's the thing. When a red blood cell is developing in the marrow, it's the hemoglobin concentration in that developing red blood cell that determines the number of cell divisions. Therefore, if the Iron, if the hemoglobin uh, synthesis is decreased, that's a signal to the red blood cell in the marrow to increase the number of mitoses. And you all know that when cells mitose, they go from something that was originally big to something smaller. You already know that. 
And so because of the decrease in hemoglobin uh, synthesis in those red blood cells, for the reasons we'll talk about momentarily, there's extra divisions. Voila, and like we said. So that's the mechanism of that. So all four groups of microcytic anemias have a decrease in hemoglobin. That's what characterizes them now. So all we have to do is think about hemoglobin synthesis. It is easy. So hemoglobin's heme plus globin. Okay, what's heme? Iron plus protoporphyrin equals heme. What's globin? Well, that's going to be you guys. Okay, we've, got a, we've got a woman over here. She's alpha. That's a good thing to be. We have beta. Not too bad. Delta? Meh. Yeah. Gamma? Meh. Yeah. 2-alpha, 2-beta? Talk to me. Hemoglobin A. 2-alpha, two 2-delta? Two Talk to me. A2. 2-alpha, two 2-gamma? Two F. Very good. Those are your globin chains. Heme, iron plus protoporphyrin, plus globin chains equals hemoglobin. Okay. Now, we can dispense with two of the four microcytic anemias in a split second. Iron deficiency, you don't have iron! <laughs> okay? Whoa! Therefore, there's no iron here to put together with protoporphyrin to form heme. So that's easy. Okay? That's the mechanism. No iron, no heme. No heme, no hemoglobin. Whoa. All right. Anemia, chronic disease. It's something built into our system that God put there, and that is when we have inflammation, our, our bodies respond to inflammation as if it's an infection. Now, you may or may not have learned in microbiology that bugs, particularly bacteria, increase their reproduction with iron. So the more iron, the more they reproduce. And so the concept is when you have anemia chronic inflammation and the body assumes that it's related to a bacterial infection, the object is to keep iron away from the bacteria. Okay. How does it do that? Well, it's like a safety deposit box. You have the key. Okay. Iron is normally stored in macrophages in the bone marrow. Okay. That's where transferrin goes to pick up the iron to deliver to the red blood cell. And it's like a safety deposit box. Since we don't want bacteria to have access to iron, we're going to lock it away in those macrophages in the bone marrow and lose the key. So we've got lots of iron in those macrophages in the bone marrow. Lots of it, but you can't get it out. So what's the good news? The good news is you're keeping it away from the bugs so they can't reproduce. What's the bad news? You're keeping it away from the red blood cells so you have a decrease in hemoglobin synthesis. But unlike iron deficiency, where there are no, there is no iron in the macrophages in the bone marrow, there's piles of iron in the macrophages, but it's like a safety deposit box, and you're the only one that has the key, and you lost it. And so you can't get it out. So, irrespective of that, you don't, your serum iron's decreased because it's all locked in the macrophages, and so you don't have enough iron to make heat. So it's basically the same mechanism as iron deficiency, but for different reasons. One, you have no iron. The second one is you have lots of it, but it's locked in a safety deposit box, and you can't get it. Either way, you can't make heme, you can't make hemoglobin. So we knocked out two out of the four already. The next one is the least common of the microcytic anemias, and we call them sideroblastic anemias. What's sidero mean? It's another word for iron. So this iron has lots of terms. Ferric, you know, ferro, sidero, both of them mean iron. Now, you're going to learn in biochemistry that there are certain biochemical reactions that are in the cytosol. There are certain biochemical reactions that are in the inner mitochondrial membrane, oxidative phosphorylation. The mitochondrial matrix, beta oxidation of fatty acids, TCA cycle. And in the cytosol, and the mitochondria. Gluconeogenesis starts in the mitochondria, ends up in the cytosol. Urea synthesis starts in the mitochondria, goes into the cytosol, comes back into the mitochondria, and heme synthesis. Part of it in the mitochondria, part of it in the cytosol, part of it in the mitochondria again. So there's three 
different biochemical reactions that have cytosol and a mitochondrial component. With me? Well, the first part of heme synthesis, or porphyrin synthesis, because that's what this is, okay, begins in the mitochondria. That's what this square is. This is a red blood cell in the bone marrow. That's its membrane. That is its mitochondria. Okay, and the first reaction is a must-know reaction. Now, it's succinyl-CoA. Remember, that's in the TCA cycle. It's a substrate for gluconeogenesis. And if we can put that together with glycine, the simplest amino acid. Did you know glycine is a neurotransmitter? I hope you do. Is it a stimulatory one or an inhibitory one? It's inhibitory. Of what? Muscle. And what blocks it? Tetanospasm. Tetanus toxin. Blocks glycine. And that's why I get opisthotinus, rhesus sardonicus, and all that excess tetanic contraction. You've inhibited glycine. So now the bottom of the muscles are in a constant state of, tone, of a contraction. Hopefully you knew that already. Every third amino acid in collagen is glycine. And here we see glycine also involved in heme synthesis. Whoa! So here it is, glycine, and here's the, here's the rate limiting enzyme. You better know, when Hansen's done lecturing to you, you better know every rate limiting enzyme for every important biochemical reaction. If you don't, you're going to get a pile of questions wrong. That is the absolute single most important thing in biochemistry. What's the rate limiting reaction? You happen to know what it is in cholesterol synthesis? You should, because you talked about a drug that blocked it, HMG-CoA reductase. Okay. Well, what do you think the rate-limiting enzyme is in heme synthesis or porphyrin synthesis? AL aminolevulinic acid synthase. Now, what's the cofactor for this? Our little friend pyridoxine. All right. And so what happens is it comes together and you form delta amino levulinic acid, then you got a bunch of other crap enzymes, blah, 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 and you go to porphyrin, urophorphyrin, copropyrin, back into the mitochondria. Why don't you mention the other things? Because they're not important. Oh, okay. And so I got put. <laughs> it's funny, like I'm talking to myself as if it's a person in me, but really I'm not crazy. <laughs> okay, I'm really. I'm really trying to put into words what some of you are thinking, okay? And it also wakes you up a little bit, okay? I really have to do this in the afternoons, which is the absolute worst time to lecture of all. It's the afternoon. Worst. Okay. So we have a little protoporphyrin here, and then plus iron. Now, who go put those two together? Well, here we got this metal with protoporphyrin. So it's going to have to be some kind of chelatase, because chelating agent. And so it's called ferrochelatase. That combines iron together with protoporphyrin to form our little friend heme. Heme has a feedback mechanism, as do all rate-limiting enzymes, with ALA synthase. So if heme's increased, it inhibits ALA synthase. If heme is decreased, it enhances it. Understand? Good. All right. Now, let's deal with these rarest of the microcytic anemias, sideroblastic anemias. There's three main causes. Uno, that means one. Okay. Alcohol. Now, that's not to say that sideroblastic anemia is the most common anemia in alcohol. Now, some students think that's what I said. No, I just said that the most common cause of sideroblastic anemia is alcohol, an alcoholic. Actually, the most common anemia overall, believe it or not, is anemia of chronic disease followed by folate deficiency. So this is not common, but the most common cause of this not common anemia is alcohol. Why? It's a mitochondrial poison. Remember, it uncoupled oxidative phosphorylation. It damaged the inner mitochondrial membrane. It allowed protons to go in there and drain them off. If you do an electron micrograph of the mitochondria in an alcoholic, they're huge. They're called mega mitochondria. They're damaged. So any process that occurs in the mitochondria is really screwed up, which includes heme synthesis. And so what happens is iron, being dumb, gets delivered to the red blood cell by transferrin, and it says, duh, where am I supposed to go? Well, some of you stay there, and it gets stored as a little bit of ferritin, but most of the time you're going to make it direct, so go 
right into the mitochondria. Bad news. Why? You can get in, but you can't get out. Now, iron probably tries it, bonk, 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 and okay, it's trying to get out of the mitochondria, but here it is, you've got this damaged mitochondria, which it doesn't know it's damaged by alcohol, it goes in there and it can't get out. So would you all agree that you're going to get lots of iron being, being, uh, being caught in that mitochondria, and that mitochondria is going to start filling up with iron, huh? A mitochondria located around the nucleus of a, of a red blood cell in the bone marrow, yeah? And so we have the ringed sideroblast related to that, which is the marker cell for sideroblastic anemia. It's also an iron overload disease. You will have excess iron because of this. And you're not going to get heme because the whole stinking mitochondria is damaged by alcohol. So that's the most common cause. Okay, then we have B6 deficiency, which is called pyridoxine, as you recall. If you're deficient in this because you didn't have it given to you when you're taking isoniazid for treatment of your uh, tuberculosis, then what's going to happen? Well, this is clear. No B6, no heme. The very first reaction is not going to happen. But iron doesn't know that. It has no brain. And so it just goes, goes right in there, and it says, we put a porphyrin. It's not here. I'm going to try to get out. Bonk, bonk, bonk. Can't. Ring sideroblast. All right. The third is lead poisoning. All right. So lead actually produces a sideroblastic anemia. Now lead is a denaturer. All heavy metals denature proteins. Are enzymes proteins? Yes or no? Yes. So they, it denatures lots of proteins. And the one it likes to do it the most is this one, ferrochelatase. That's its favorite enzyme to <clears throat> screw it up. It's denatured. What does that mean? It don't work. Isn't that cool? You're okay up the end. <clears throat> you knock that off. No heme. No hemoglobin. Microcytic anemia. It has a less of an inhibitory effect, but it does have a little one on amino levulinic acid dehydrates, too. So you can have it here or can have it here. But the one you want to remember is the one it most commonly knocks off, and that's ferroketase. Okay, so when iron comes into this, uh, it can, can come into the mitochondria, it's not going to be able to bind with protoporphyrin to form heme. Voila, no heme, decreased hemoglobin, microcytic anemia. Now, I'd ask you a question, because this deals with products related to enzymes. If ferrochelatase is decreased or inhibited, heme decreases, but what happens to protoporphin before the block? Increases. And that used to be the screening test of choice for lead poisoning. Okay? Maybe you'd have an increase in red blood cell protoporphin. It's not used anymore, and I can figure out why that is. I wonder if you can. If you don't have iron present because you have anemia or chronic disease or you have iron deficiency, what do you think is going to happen to protoporphyrin in the, in, the, in, the, in the mitochondria? It's going to increase. And so what they did, what they, they found out, they got a lot of people that had an increase in red blood cell protoporphyrin, and then when they got blood lead levels, they were negative, and said, oh God, we've got a patient with iron deficiency or anemia or chronic disease. And so in other words, it wasn't very good screen because they ended up working up other anemias. So now that is no longer the test of choice for screening or, or for, uh, for, for screening or confirming lead poisoning. They just go right to the money. Blood, lead level is the screening and confirmatory test for lead poisoning. R RBC protoporphyrin, no longer. Too many false positives. Okay? All right. That's the only, that's the only concept I wanted to get out here so far in terms of pathogenesis. Now we're going to deal with the thalassemias. And pathogenesis we're talking about now. So you're still alpha. I haven't changed. Any of you guys want to change? Say no. No. You're still beta. You're still delta. You're still gamma. Okay? Now let's deal with uh, the thalassemias, which are genetic diseases, autosomal recessive. Let's deal with the simplest one, the easiest one, alpha thalassemia. If you're interested where they are, it's under the little, little charts that deal with uh, the anemias and thalassemia and the mechanisms. You don't really need to look because it's just very, very simple. Now listen to me. See, so you could be going there and you're going to miss the whole point. You're going to miss thalassemia as fast. I mean, it's going to be like a jet plane <laughs> right over your head. Okay? All right. Now, who do we see alpha thalassemia in? 
two main groups of people, the uh, Asian population and the black population. In fact, all genetic um, uh, diseases involving hematology are seen in, in the black population. G6PD, beta thal, alpha thal, sickle, all of them are, are commonly seen in the black population. Okay, so alpha thal is far eastern black population. Okay, now let's talk about hemoglobin electrophoresis so we can understand how we can diagnose the thalassemia. Hemoglobin electrophoresis is like any other electrophoresis. It separates things out on the basis of size and charge. And so you can clearly separate out hemoglobin A, hemoglobin F, and hemoglobin A2 clearly on cellulose acetate because they have different migrations. And so they do that. So they phoresis it, hemoglobin A settles out, hemoglobin A2 settles out, hemoglobin F settles out. So how do they know how much is there? They stain the cellulose acetate thing. And so it produces density. The density is going to correlate with the concentration of each of those hemoglobins. So how are they going to know what the percentage is? Simple. They run a densitometer straight across it, and it converts the density of the stain to a percentage. And it turns out that U hemoglobin A, two alphas, two betas, is the predominant hemoglobin in an adult, 95-96%. U hemoglobin A2, two alphas, two deltas, uh, maybe one or two percent. U hemoglobin F, two alphas, two gammas, maybe one percent. That's the normal. So notice it's expressed as a percentage. You with me now? Good, here we go. Alpha thalassemia, autosomal recessive, is a problem in making alpha globin chains. Do all of you guys, A, A2, and F, require her to make you? Absolutely. So all of you are equally decreased. If she's decreased, your, your hemoglobin A is decreased. If she's decreased, hemoglobin A is de de A2 is decreased. If she's decreased, hemoglobin F is decreased. Will that show up on an electrophoresis? No. So the hemoglobin electrophoresis is totally normal because they're all equally decreased. So there's no way it can pick it up. Now, turns out there are four genes that control alpha globin chain synthesis. Four. If you have a deletion of one of those four, you don't even have anemia. So you don't even have to worry about that one. If you have, I've got to watch my fingers. I don't want a bad finger up here. Okay. Okay. It's going to hit you. Did you see someone that broke this finger and they got this big cast like that and it comes out like that and it's so cool and they put it out in the window and they got this big thing making a statement to the whole world. Okay. But anyway, two gene deletions, problem. You are minimally decreased. Okay? And so you're going to have a mild anemia. And the reason why it's going to be microcytokized is because the globin part is not going to, is going to be decreased. Right? Okay, so you remember that's going to mean that you're going to get a microcytic anemia. You're going to have a decrease in, in hemoglobin concentration. That'll be the stimulus. Okay, you understand that? That's called alpha thalassemia minor. We see this in the far eastern population and the black population. Now, if you have three gene deletions, that's not good. Rarely do they ask this on boards, but whatever. You are really decreased. Okay. And so what happens is there's a really, really bad anemia. In fact, it even has a hemolytic component to it. And you beta chains, you get really irritated that there's no alpha chains around. So you get so irritated that you form your own hemoglobin. So four of you get together, and so you have four beta chains together, and you form hemoglobin H. Now, if you do an electrophoresis there, is hemoglobin H a different hemoglobin? Yes. You think it'll migrate in a different place than other normal hemoglobin? Yeah. So that one you can diagnose with hemoglobin electrophoresis. So that's why it's called hemoglobin H disease. Okay. Four gene deletions, you never really even are born alive. It's a spontaneous abortion usually. And I got an interesting correlation there. Okay. You gamma chains, seeing what beta chain did when it was irritated, you say, where is alpha chain? Of course, there ain't any. Okay. And so you say, i got to do something. What are you going to do? I'm going to pull my own hemoglobin. Four gammas. That's called hemoglobin barts. Would that show up on electrophoresis? Yeah. Would it matter? No. Why? There's no baby. Baby's dead. Now I'd ask you a very simple question to see if you can put this together. What do you think the spontaneous abortion rate is in the Far East? Very high. Why? 
because that's where alpha thalassemia is most commonly located. Therefore, what cancer do you think would be most commonly seen in the Far East if the, it cre if the incidence of spontaneous abortions is increased? Corneal carcinoma. There you go. And that's true. It's just a perfect logarithmic relationship. If there's an increase in my abortions, as you know, spontaneous abortions as well as hydatidiform moles all predispose to corneal carcinoma. There's an extremely high incidence of corneal carcinoma in the Far East because of alpha thalassemia. Do you understand what I just said? That's classic board stuff. Putting things together and integrating it. All right. We're done with alpha thal. How do you treat it? I can tell you how you don't treat it. Don't give them iron. That's what most of the morons do out there. Oh, you got some microcytic anemia. I can't think. Hemoglobin electrophoresis is normal. It's got to be something bad. We're going to give you iron. Oh, that's the worst thing you can do. Then you iron overload them, and now you're going to kill them. You leave them alone. You say, hey, you got this. You got probably have alpha thalassemia because everything is looking like that. The hemoglobin electrophoresis. It's nothing. Don't worry about it. Okay. You got alpha thal. It's nothing. Really? A lot of times people like that. Sometimes they make little shirts. I have alpha thal. Ask me about my alpha thalassemia. Why? Okay, because, because they have something unique that won't hurt them. It's like Gil Barron's disease. You know, the most co second most common cause of jaundice. <gasps> Is it bad, Doc? No, no, it's nothing, nothing, nothing. You just get jaundice maybe when you haven't eaten. It's nothing, right? Right, nothing. Gil Barron's. It's got a nice ring to it. Okay? I think I'll have a shirt. Ask me about my Gil Barron's disease. Okay, right. These are people that are starving for information and starving to talk to people. Okay. In fact, my entire second year class did just that. They asked me about my Gilbert's disease. They did that. Okay. As a memoriam for me, I guess. All right. So we're done with alpha thal. Okay. Now beta thal is a lot more interesting. Population, not far eastern. We still have black population, and we have Greek and Italians. So black, Greek, and Italians, beta thal. Okay, you're not thinking beta thal see me in Far Easterns. All right. You're decreased. Okay. Beta chain. Now, they did ask a question if that was B plus on the top, beta with zero on the top, and just B by itself. B by itself means you're making a normal amount of beta chains. B with a little positive on it means that you're, you're not making, you are making it, but not, not a lot. B with a zero over it, you're not making it at all. Okay, so that's what those different uh, things mean. Okay, now this is a bit different. This is a bit different because beta thalassemia, even though it's autosomal recessive, has nothing to do with gene deletions. It deals with splicing defects. It deals with stop codons. In fact, the very, very severest form of beta thalassemia is a stop codon. So that means you absolutely terminate or never even start making beta chains. That's what stop codons do. I mean, that's about my knowledge of DNA, too, right there. Stop codon. I understand stop. Okay. All right. But let's deal with the mild one, which is the one I ask on part one boards. You are slightly decreased beta chains, probably because of a splicing defect. But alpha, are you okay? Say yes. Are you okay, delta? Say yes. Are you okay, gamma? Okay, he just shakes his head because he's a fetus. I can't talk. All right. <laughs> All right, so we can understand why you don't talk, because you're a hemoglobin atom. Okay. <laughs> you can start babbling, though. Can you babble a little bit? Okay. Beta chains, you're decreased. Alpha, you're okay. Delta, you're okay. You're okay. So what hemoglobin is going to decrease? A. Okay. And what's going to increase, actually, because you're decreased and she's available, delta is going to get together. Hemoglobin A2, gamma is going to get together hemoglobin F. So we have a decrease in A and an increase in A2 and F. Will that show up on a hemoglobin electrophoresis? Yes. And the reason why it did is because beta chain was decreased, and that decreased hemoglobin A, that would show up. So the only way you can diagnose beta thalassemia is with hemoglobin electrophoresis. What are you going to do about it? Nothing. You better pray that it ain't the severe type where you're not making any or hardly any beta chains. That's called Cooley's anemia. You're not going to live past, you know, 30. You're going to have a constant transfusion requirement. And in fact, most of the time they die of iron overload disease from all those multiple transfusions or hepatitis C and hepatitis B and HIV. It's horrible. It's a horrible disease. That's called Cooley's anemia. But they don't usually ask that. 
Usually it's just a mild beta thalassemia. Very, very common. Very, very, very common anemia. You see it very, very commonly. Okay? Now, if you really understood what I said, then you should be able to answer this question. And this is most commonly seen in the black population again. It's a genetic disease. It's very common, actually. And it's called beta delta thalassemia. I want you to tell me what would the hemoglobin electrophoresis show if it was a beta delta thalassemia. Hemoglobin H, uh, F rather, is the answer. Okay? That's the, for those that didn't get that, beta delta. So beta change your decrease. Delta. Delta change your decrease. So who's left? Alpha, gamma. It's called hemoglobin F disease. It's called hereditary persistence of hemoglobin F. It's a nothing hemoglobinopathy. Okay, you don't have anemia, nothing. It's just interesting. You just basically have predominantly hemoglobin F. Okay, and so that's with beta delta. If you understood that, then you really understand the concept of how the thalassemias work. It's good. So we're done with that. As a matter of fact, we're done with this chart. Okay, so if you want, you can go to the, uh, to the uh, tables if you want. Let's just discuss some of the causes of iron deficiency anemia. And the best way of understanding that is by age brackets. Um, prematurity is clear-cut why that, why, why that would produce uh, uh, iron deficiency, because every day that a baby's not in utero, it's losing iron. Okay, so that's an easy one. Their iron stores are all decreased. That's why all preemies have to be given iron supplements, because they all would develop iron deficiency. How about a newborn? If they had iron deficiency, check their stool. Probably it's going to be positive for their blood, the way you're going to prove that, whether it's their blood versus mommy's blood, which it swallows with the apt test, like the first three letters of aptitude, that's part two. Most of the time, blood in the stool of a newborn, when that comes out with meconium, is blood the baby swallowed from mommy. So it'll be, have hemoglobin A in it. But for some reason, it was hemoglobin F blood that came out of the baby's stool. Most common cause is Meckel's diverticulum. So bleeding Meckel's diverticulum is the most common cause of iron deficiency in a newborn. Also, I might add, child in general, Meckel's diverticulum. Don't put Meckel's diverticulum as a cause of iron deficiency in an adult, because most of them will have bled by four years of age, and so you already would have known you had it. I mean, that would be way down your list for iron deficiency in an adult, Meckel's diverticulum. If you're talking about a woman under 50, clear-cut, unequivocal menorrhagia, that's the most common cause. So you get a really good menstrual history. You know, you're under 20, the most common cause of it is going to be anovulatory cycles. Between 20 and, and 40 years of age, it's going to be ovulatory cycles, you know, with irregular shedding of the endometrium and stuff like that, inadequate luteal phase. It's, it's uh, pregnancy-related bleeds. It's uh, an endometrial polyp that's bleeding, that kind of stuff, okay? So, menorrhagia is the most common cause of iron deficiency in a woman under 50. Okay? How about men under 50? Peptic ulcer disease, and if you play odds, it'll be duodenal ulcer. Okay? Over 50, men and women, clear-cut, unequivocal colon cancer. That's what you've got to worry about. That's it. I'm done really with iron deficiency there. There's really not a whole lot more to say about it. The thalassemias... Not a whole lot more to say about it. We already know which groups of people it's in. We know that they're genetic diseases. We know that you don't do anything to them, especially give them iron. Because all their iron studies are normal. Let's just review, though, let, on the, uh, before we leave the, uh, the, uh, the iron deficiency, let's just go through the laboratory test. What's the serum iron and iron deficiency? Low. Now think, what's the TIBC? Ah, good. What's the percent saturation? No, 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 think now. It's the iron, which is low, divided by the TIBC, which is high. What's the percent saturation? Low. Now, you should be able to think that out. If you don't have iron, why would you think that you would be saturating transferrin if you don't have iron to begin with? If you don't have iron, of course the saturation of a, a transferrin is decreased because you don't have any to put on it. Doesn't even make sense. And what's the serum ferritin level? Low. All right. Anemia chronic disease, I don't have a whole lot to say about because it's related to inflammation. 
Okay? But I do have something that I want you to tell me is what the iron studies show. Can I remember what's the mechanism? It's locked in a safety deposit box. You've got plenty of iron, except you can't get it out. So what's the serum iron? Low. Now think, what's the total iron binding capacity? Low. Very good. Remember high iron stores? Decreased transference synthesis. Percent saturation? Low. But serum ferritin? High. Because you've got piles of it. So what's the main difference in laboratory tests that will distinguish chronic disease anemias from iron deficiency? Ferritin, there you go. The other one's TIBC, but no one uses that. Good. What's the iron studies in mild alpha thalassemia and mild beta thalassemia? Normal. Why? It has nothing to do with iron. It has to do with globin chains. Okay. Okay, we'll get to the sideroblastics in a second. All right, let's deal with it. We'll do it right now. Okay, first of all, I want you guys to look at this smear. Okay, see that smear right there. I want you to tell me whether there's an appropriate amount of hemoglobin in those cells. No. So that means then that they're more than likely uh, microcytic, uh, it's a more than likely a microcytic anemia, and this could be either iron deficiency, anemia, chronic disease, thalassemia, or even lead poisoning. Agreed? Okay. This is a ring sideroblast. Now, the only way you can see a ring sideroblast is to do bone marrow. Okay? And you have to stain it with Prussian blue, which stains iron. Remember, you told, and I told you that mitochondria are usually around the nucleus, and so they're all filled up with iron, and so here's the nucleus, and these are mitochondria all filled up with iron, and they, they go form a ring around there. That's why it's called a ringed sideroblast. This is pathognomonic of a sideroblastic anemia. So if you thought that B6 was producing your deficiency, was producing your microcytic anemia, you'd have to prove it. You'd have to get a bone marrow and prove that you have those ring sideroblasts. If you thought that alcohol was the cause of the microcytic anemia, if you ruled out all the other stuff, then you'd have to prove it with that. But certainly, if you suspected lead poisoning, why in God green earth would you do a bone marrow to look for one of these things? It'd be present, but isn't there something that's simpler? How about a plain old blood lead level? <laughs> okay? You don't have to do bone marrow to prove that one. You can just make your diagnosis that way. Okay? Here's another... This, this picture right here has been on many, many boards, this exact one. Here's another section with, uh, with uh, a ring sideroblast as well. Let's just deal with lead specifically now, lead poisoning. Okay. I think probably everybody in this room, if I said lead poisoning, the word that you would say would be coarse basophilic stippling. Okay, that's where you have red blood cells that have measles. They have lots of little blue spots all over them. That's probably the best one right over there. Now, do we need a special stain to see basophilic stippling? No, we don't. It shows up on a regular right heme sustain. What are they? When we say basophilic stippling, well, what are we talking about? Why do we see these little things that look like measles of the red blood cell, these little blue dots all over the place? The answer is that lead denatures ribonuclease. And the purpose of ribonuclease is to break down ribosomes. And so if it's denatured and it can't break down the ribosomes, they persist, and they give us a fantastic marker in the peripheral blood that we can see and say, this is lead poisoning. Isn't that cool? It's very, 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 very specific for lead poisoning. Coarse basophilic stippling. Okay? If it's an RNA filament, what are we talking about? A reticulocyte. But if it's a persistent ribosome, what are we talking about? Lead poisoning. Okay. Now, I want you to look at this x-ray because this x-ray was on the boards. I know exactly where it came from, the scope manual, which is no longer available now. That's where they got the picture from, and they still have it. What's this? That's the epiphyses of the fingers of a child, okay, and that's lead. The only heavy metal that can deposit in the epiphyses of bone is lead. Mercury can, arsenic can, only lead can. And so you can see the deposits in the epiphyses. That's why they had failure to grow. Because if you screw up the epiphyses of a kid, okay, they are not going to be able to grow properly. That's what the heavy metal is going to be doing. So it's the only heavy metal that will actually deposit in the epiphyses. Now they are extremely clever on lead poisoning in terms of the clinical scenarios. Okay? 
Now, the one that you all are aware of is a little dude that lives in a poor area and is eating paint or plaster on from their crib or the wall. And it was, you know, the old days, the paint had lead in it. Okay, and they get lead poisoning. And remember that the, the classic presentation, severe abdominal colic, okay, that they commonly get. They have problems with cerebral edema, okay, that can occur. So they can, they can get convulsions and stuff, stuff like that. And, of course, they're going to have a very severe microcytic anemia. You can do a flat plate of them, and you can actually see the lead in their, in their uh, intestine. You can actually see. There's three things, actually, that you can see with a flat plate. Iron, so if a kid uh, took iron tablets from, uh, say, a mommy that's uh, taking iron for um, menorrhagia, okay, and the little baby gets it and they eat the iron, okay, you can actually see on x-ray the iron tablets that are left undigested, okay? You can see lead with just a plain flat plate, and you can see mercury with just a plain flat plate. So you can see these things, actually. So abdominal colic, severe microcytic anemia, failure to thrive, cerebral edema. And there was a board question on that. What was the mechanism of the cerebral edema? Boy, I had to look big time for that one. I looked in Nelson's textbook of pediatrics, and there it was. It said that the, the uh, cerebral edema is related to increased vessel permeability in the brain and relates to the buildup of delta amino acid. Okay, remember, if you block ferrochelotase and everything distal to that block increases, right? So protoporphyrin and all those other things, including delta amino acid, and apparently it's toxic to neurons, and that's what's causing it, apparently. That was something else. I couldn't believe that one, because, I mean, it wasn't in the standard textbooks. I had to look about five different books to find that one. And, of course, it's in your notes. Okay. just want to just make sure, because you were worried. Now, that was an easy one. Then the other ones, the guys that work in an automobile factory that have abdominal colic and diarrhea, okay, lead poisoning because they have, ex they have exposure to batteries. Usually in automobile factories, they incinerate batteries to get the lead to reuse it again. So the old workers in an automobile factory with colic and diarrhea is the other one. That's pretty clever, too. Uh, the moonshine one is, is extremely a giveaway. Uh, some people still make, uh, you know, uh, uh, Alcohol in old radiators, bad thing because they were lined by lead. Okay, and so you make your alcohol, you automatically get lead poisoning. That's called, you know, moonshine. So that was one they actually put. That was kind of a giveaway. Okay, the one I think is the trickiest one for lead poisoning was the pot was the pottery painter. That was the trickiest one because pottery is commonly uh, painted with lead-based paints. Okay, and a lot of times when they paint on them, you know, to make that the tip of the of the uh, of the uh, paintbrush, you know, nice and sharp so they can make fine detail oftentimes, okay, and so they get lead on their tongue and they end up with lead poisoning. You're all aware of the fact that if you have lead, uh, if you have pottery from certain countries, which is with so many that it could be your country, we won't mention which countries, okay, uh, we could have a riot here. Not in my country! Okay, okay. In country X. In, in, in country X, okay, the pottery that you can use for dishes is often has lead-based paint on them, and you can get lead poisoning from that. Okay. So those are the scenarios. Those are the only ones that have ever been asked on board. The classic kid eating plaster, the moonshine question, the guys that work in an automobile factory, and the one that is a pottery painter, the way they ask the lead poisoning questions. I can't even imagine any other one they could use. Adults seem to get the neuropathies, you know, the foot slapping gait of perineal palsy, the wrist drop of radial nerve palsy, the claw hand of ulnar nerve palsy, uh, the lead lines in the teeth. Adults usually get that with the colic and diarrhea. Okay? That's it. We're done with, with those diseases. All right. Now to see if you got everything. Here we go. You have a chart that fills us in. You ready? We have iron deficiency here. We have iron, TIBC, percent ferritin. Let's go. Iron, what is it? Low, TIBC. High percent sac, low ferritin, very good. A for all of you. Second one, anemia, chronic disease. Iron, TIBC, percent sac, low ferritin, very good. Another A, little smiling stickers with a little smile, a little yellow, just stick them on your forehead. I don't have one, just make believe. But you got to make believe for crying out loud. <sighs> okay. Alpha and beta thal, iron, normal. TIBC, percent sac, ferritin, 
What are you going to do about it? Nothing. Very good. You guys are so good. You guys are so good. Now, lead poisoning, as well as all the other sideroblastic anemias, are iron oblicis finishedness. You, you, don't worry, you get the time. I'm type A on this thing. It is, is an iron overload thing, just like hemochromatosis and hemosiderosis are. This is all that excess and iron. So it's iron overload. That's what all I'm going to tell you. This is tricky. If you get this one, you're really good. Now, iron should be no problem. What's the serum iron in an iron overload disease? Hi. Okay, now I want you to think. What are the iron stores? What are the iron stores in iron overload disease? Very good. So therefore, what's the TIBC? Low. Very good. Think iron overload disease. Percent saturation. High. Very good. And then, of course, what's the theranin? High. You know what the natural tendency to do when you have iron overload disease? Think everything's high. And so you commonly say, high, 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 high. Wrong. High, low, high, high. Right. Break. 